This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. All right, welcome everyone to our uh, second uh, spe um, lecture of the series. Uh, I'm very pleased, happy to introduce to you today Mike Olson. He's the CEO of Cloudera. Uh, this is not his uh, first company. He's effectively a serial entrepreneur. I can see uh, lessons here from uh, four companies. Um, uh, one of the companies prior to this was Sleepy Cat Software which um, was in part based on uh, a Berkeley database, and I'm sure that will uh, come up in, in the discussion. That company was acquired by Oracle, and, uh, and so he's also been Vice President of Embedded Technologies at Oracle Corporation. And I'll say, best of all, uh, he has two very good degrees, both of them from UC Berkeley, uh, both in computer science. So welcome. When I was preparing for this talk, I thought of a, a bunch of different stuff I could do. I thought one thing that interests me a lot right now that I could do would be to talk about technology trends, what's happening in business, what's happening in the markets, what's happening in new products. And I'm actually glad to talk about that stuff, but I decided not to make it the focus of this talk for two reasons. Um, the first is that I'm not sure where all you guys are in your careers, and I may tell you stuff I think is deep and insightful today, and two years from now, I may be totally irrelevant, right? So I want to be careful about giving advice on that stuff. And then the other is, I think, you know, I looked at the lineup of the people you have coming through here. Adam Bosworth was next week. You've got some great entrepreneurs and innovators coming through. There will be lots of opportunities to talk about that stuff. I thought what I would do instead was I'd tell a story that, I learned basically over the course of the last couple of decades working in a series of startup companies. Really, how I think now about my job, what I do for a living, and the core principles I try to hold to when I'm thinking about the business, when I'm dealing with the people. Let me begin by telling you a little about myself. I am a serial dropout at UC Berkeley. I've dropped out of school here three times. Uh, I came back repeatedly. Uh, my most recent dropout was from the PhD program, uh, so I was a year along after my master's in pursuit of a doctorate under Mike Stonebreaker in the engineering school. Uh, I dropped out then, and I do not expect to fix that dropout. I think that I'm done. Uh, I did work on two pieces of pretty well-known Berkeley technology. Berkeley DB, uh, as Dr. Sudhu said, was the, the core of Sleepy Cat, my immediately prior company. Uh, and then also there was a pretty interesting object relational database we invented here called Postgres, uh, and I was one of the key engineers on that. Over the course of my career, because of the graduate work and the undergraduate work I did here, really, I've started a whole bunch of different database companies. It is kind of my thing. Uh, I began as a technologist. I transitioned to the dark side after a couple of years of coding professionally, uh, moved into sales and marketing, and then eventually running companies. Uh, also, I have four years on my resume working as a farm worker, bartender, and line cook overseas. Just a little bit more about me, uh, the companies I was at. Uh, from 1993 to 1997, I was at a company called Illustra that was the first company to commercialize the Postgres database system out of Berkeley. Uh, and that was a tremendous success. We grew that business very quickly. It was a lot of fun. And we sold it to Informix for about half a billion dollars in 1990. Six, I stuck around a little bit after that acquisition. Uh, and then I went and made my biggest, well, I'd say my biggest mistake, uh, my highest value learning opportunity. Uh, I went to Molecular Applications Group, uh, a field in which I had no experience, to take a job for a boss whom I had no idea about, never knew, uh, and really in a role that I had never tried before. Uh, and as you can imagine, that was fraught with learning. Uh, I left after a year joined Sleepy Cat kind of by accident. Uh, that was outstanding. We grew that organically. I'll talk a little bit about funding later. 
uh, sold to Oracle in 2006, stuck around for a couple more years helping Oracle spin up a new business unit. Uh, and most recently, I have founded Cloudera. I'm glad to talk about Cloudera, but I don't want to make this a Cloudera commercial today. Here's how I approach this talk. Uh, one of my co-founders at Sleepy Cat was a guy named Keith Bostick. He worked in the computer systems research group on Berkeley Unix back in the day. And he plays this thought experiment with himself. If you could find yourself in a bar 20 years ago and give yourself a note card, what would you write on it? What is the critical thing that you wish today that you knew back then? Uh, and so I have used that as the fuel for this talk. This is some stuff that I wish I had learned when I was sitting where you guys are sitting right now. I, I wound up learning it very much the hard way. The first thing is maybe a little bit obvious. And you're going to hear this from many of the speakers, I suspect, that you talk to over the course of this semester. Your career is long. Your jobs are short. You really owe it to yourself to find things to do that are interesting to you, that are, that are, that, that create a real sense of passion in you. It is absolutely painful to get up and go to a job that doesn't interest you, that you're not excited about. And, and I look at my time at Molecular Applications Group as a great example of that for myself. I wasn't having fun. I wasn't interested in the problems we were solving. And it was nothing but work to get up in the morning, drive to that job, put in 10, 12 hours a day, and go home. You've got an opportunity, based on who you are and where you are right now, to choose an interesting future for yourself, to pick jobs that you want to work on. Except for that one year mulligan, except for the time that I spent at MAG. And actually, let me qualify that. That was interesting. It was just interesting in a really painful way. I think across my career, even when I was a farm worker, even when I was cooking or tending bar, I have had jobs that have really been interesting, that I've learned a lot from. You should, when you are choosing your job, make that choice. If you've got two in front of you, one that pays well and the one that you're passionate about, I'd argue you should choose the, the one that you're passionate about. I've made a bunch of very ill-advised economic decisions over the course of my career, walked away from substantial equity in different companies. I've never regretted doing that because, in fact, you'll always have the opportunity to create new value, to, to have a great exit later. But also, you're going to do a much better job of that. You're going to have much more fun at it if you care about what you're doing. The second thing I want to tell you, and, and this lesson came very much the hard way for me, you should know absolutely everything you can. I'm mostly talking to the engineering students here because you guys are like me. I deeply understand relational databases and database technology. It would be hard to find anyone in the world who knows more about starting open, so open source database companies than me. I'm not bragging. It's just who I am. It's what I've been doing for 20 years. I know pretty much everything there is to know in this market and in this technology. And as a result, the company that I'm in right now is so obviously a winner to me that I had no hesitation in leaping in. When we started Cloudera in 2008, a bunch of smart people I know, great investors, other technologists, customers, looked at what I was doing and thought I was an idiot. I knew that it was a great idea. And in fact, I was surprised that no one else could see that it was a great idea. I think time has borne me out on this. The company is doing great. We've grown very quickly. But it was because I understood technology, the problems that customers had, and what was coming in the market, the, the explosion of data, the, the need to process stuff in new ways. Because I'd spent so much time getting smart about the technology, I was able to see an opportunity and then go build a company that nobody else was. Now, when I say know every, everything you can, of course, there are all kinds of unknowns in business. You don't have to know the future, but you should really understand the foundation of your company. When I think personally about the CEOs that I admire most, I think of guys like uh, John Chambers at Cisco, uh, or actually Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook. These are guys who are serious, serious technologists who really know the systems that they want to build and how they apply to uh, customers' lives. A professional manager could not have built those companies. Someone who was not passionate, not deep in the technology, didn't get customers, couldn't have made it happen. So you should really learn everything you can about what you are doing. 
The third thing I want to advise you to do is to look for pain. The most common cause of failure in startups, in my view, is some technologists who are excited about the stuff they're building and decide that it must be the basis for a good company. If you don't know what you will do for customers, if you haven't figured out how this technology, how this idea is really going to make people feel less pain, why they'll buy, you're not going to have a successful company. This is very carefully chosen word, wording on the slide. Uh, you can actually charge more money for alleviating pain than you can for selling pleasure. If you can find a real problem, a real business problem, a real personal problem that people have, they may not realize they have it, but a real problem that they have, you will build a successful company. You'll have the basis for a strong revenue stream. I think that this single maxim is one that you should take out of this class and this school. If you're starting a company, you have to look not just at the technology, you have to not just understand the technology deeply, but you really have to understand what you're doing when you bring it to market. Why are people going to care? You can't figure that out later. You've got to understand it yourself. Y you may well be wrong in some important respects. The stuff that we believed customers badly wanted to do when we started Cloudera often was not exactly what they wanted to do. But the core, the core source of pain in that market we saw correctly. A lot of data that needed to be analyzed in new ways. So paying attention to the business problem of your audience is absolutely critical. This was a very, very hard lesson. So I started four companies about. I joined Illustra a little bit after it had started. Um, when you walk out of this class, when you walk out of Berkeley, I think a lot of you want to be entrepreneurs. You want to figure out how will I start my own company. Maybe I understand technology very well. And, and I want to be the CTO or the CEO or I want to be the strategy person for this business. I, I want to be sort of the, the core fundamental team member with maybe one or two other people that I'm going to work with. Those relationships are the most fraught that you will have in your life. I'm married. I've been married for 20 years. That relationship is easier than the one that I have with my co-founders. The pressure is enormous in a small company. You need skills that complement yours. So you've got to figure out what you're good at doing and what you're going to need in the business that you're not good at doing. And you've got to go find people who bring those skills, who can do those things to complement yours. But they also have to be people that you trust deeply. Uh, actually, I'll tell you one anecdote. So when I was running Sleepy Cat, I had three Berkeley co-founders or, or sort of co-owners. Uh, Keith Bostick was the thought experiment guy I mentioned earlier. Uh, another guy, Mike Ubell, I'd known for a long time. He was a database geek. Uh, Margo Seltzer was a Berkeley grad student with me in the engineering school. She's now on the faculty at Harvard. Margo and I had known each other forever. We were very good friends. At Sleepy Cat, we would get in serious, knockdown, screaming fights with one another over strategy, over execution, over detail. Right? It was very, very hard. The only reason that that didn't destroy the company was that we deeply trusted one another. We had a foundation of friendship for several years. We knew that the other had the best interests of the business in mind. And each of us was willing to believe that the other person was convinced they were right. We thought they were wrong, but, but a smart person who thinks they're right. You need someone that you're able to disagree with and yet trust in that way. And that's a very hard, that's a very hard set of properties to find in a co-founder for a business. In another company that I started, we had a bad experience with, a, with, with one of the founders on the team. Uh, chemistry was wrong. The, the skill set was not what we thought it was when we started out. That is an enormously expensive mistake to unwind after the fact. It happens that founders leave the businesses that they start, absolutely, and, and there's no real stigma attached to it. But navigating through the very early days of bringing somebody in and trying to build that team cohesion to, look, we're going to split up, 
is enormously difficult. There's all kinds of ego involved. By the way, once you're funded, there's all kinds of money involved, and there is generally the threat of a lawsuit involved. It's way better to figure out in advance if this is someone you want to be with that intensely and to make the decision very, very carefully. I, I'd also advise you, you know, I, I'm actually an awful example because my last two companies have had four founders each. Like two is a good number, right? You want somebody who balances your point of view. You don't want to be a dictator. But if you get too many voices and too many stakeholders in the room, it can be very, very difficult to make decisions. Next thing I've learned is that it's actually fantastically easy these days to raise money. Uh, I think it's gotten easier in the last 10 years. There's been an explosion just in the last five years in the kinds of investors that you can talk to. So back in the day, there were venture capitalists and there were in, you know, basically your friends and your family. Right? You could raise a little bit of, bit of money on your credit card. You could go ask your parents or your, your friends for some cash. Or you could go pitch the guys on uh, Sand Hill Road and raise substantial money from them. These days, the acknowledged categories are angel, and that's somebody who's an individual, probably had a good exit in the past, and, and puts a little bit of money into a business. That might be $50,000 or $100,000, enough to cover you while you're just getting started, while you're playing with some ideas, so you don't starve, but you're not paying yourself a real salary at that time. Very limited funding for a limited period, enough to test an idea. There's also this new category, a super angel. I, uh, they define themselves. It, it seems to mean mostly an angel who's gotten so well connected that all of his friends just pile on his deals, right? Um, so you can raise actually $2 million from a coalition of individuals these days, right? And, and that's enough money as an entrepreneur to go do some real substantial stuff, particularly these days when you can fire up a bunch of stuff on Amazon Web Services. You don't need to buy a lot of hardware. Your capital requirements for starting the business are much, much lower. Uh, there are uh, conventional institutional VCs, the big names that you hear, Axel Partners, Greylock, Index, the people who make the marquee investments long term. And then there are these late stage investors, people who don't invest in companies for the first five or ten years, but then pile on shortly before exit and, and uh, make a, a smaller return on their investment, but uh, get a much higher rate of hit, basically. They, they, they are able to back more successful companies because they join later. All these kinds of money are, are available to you now, right? Uh, that wasn't the case in the past. Coming out of this school with a good idea, and by the way, because you know your technology deeply and because you're going to choose your co-founders wisely and so on, you should be able to put a pitch deck together that gets funded pretty easily. You should pay careful attention to what you put in that pitch deck. You should look at other examples from other entrepreneurs that, that you can steal good structure and ideas from. But it's not going to be too hard for you guys to make money. I'll offer just one more insight here. Uh, and this is even from my immediate company. When we pitch the investors, you know, we put together a deck. Here are the five things we're going to do. Here's how we're going to spend your money. Within six months, about half that plan was just bull. It was just totally wrong. When you get started working with the market and engage, of course, that plan is going to go south. You're going to do something different in reaction to the market. Good investors will stand alongside you. And in fact, good investors will put more money into your company later as you grow. Right? So raising money these days is blindingly easy. The thing that's hard is bringing good people into the organization. So I talked about the risk of finding good founders earlier. And I absolutely believe that that is a critical problem. But over the course of two or three years that you're starting your business, that you want to run it, you want to build product, you want to deliver it, you're going to need to hire office staff. You're going to need engineers, sales, marketing people. And finding those people is very, very difficult. This is probably the biggest single thing that I struggle with at Cloudera. You need to hire fast enough to build your business. You need to add good people who bring the skills you need. You don't want to hire way in advance of market demand. So you want to be a little bit gated. You want to bring people on just as you need them. You find a superstar, you almost always want to bring them on, but you need to know what they're going to work on. It is very common to decide in your head, look, we need to find a programmer who knows this particular piece of technology. Or 
we need a salesperson with experience in this particular market, and to go looking for those people, and for a couple of months not to find them, and as a result to settle. And that is deadly. Bringing on somebody who wouldn't have met your bar originally, something, somebody who you really feel like is a second choice, uh, colors the organization as a whole. Second choice people will bring on more second choice people, especially early in the life of your company. You need to build a team that is stellar. People you would trust to walk out into the wilderness all by themselves and represent the entire company. Finding those people is very hard. It's possible. You have to create a culture that attracts them. You have to be the kind of leader that makes them want to come and work for you. But it's very, very important to your long-term success that you hire well. So I'm the CEO of my company, and, and this slide is mostly pitched at other people who want to be the CEO. I think it's also true if you want to be a strategy leader or active in marketing and sales, right? I think if you want to be sort of business focused, that's important. Technology, a little bit less so, at least in the way that I mean it. So I say be a generalist, what do I mean? Over the course of my career, I've been a programmer and an architect. I've been a support engineer. I have run and done marketing, and I've carried a bag. I've been a salesperson. That experience actually allows me to understand each of those jobs in a way that is very valuable to me now. The first and most obvious observation is that it's hard to trick me about what's possible and what's impossible, right? I've closed a lot of deals. I built a lot of software. I don't write code for a living anymore, but I at least understand what technology can do. So I'm able to know when the product team or when the sales team is sandbagging on me. And that's important. Uh, by the way, I'm also able to talk to customers and understand what they're doing. Being broad in that way, especially if you want a senior leadership role in a company, is important. You should decide if that senior leadership role is important to you. If it is, you probably want to make a career plan that gives you that kind of diversity, that lets you move around among a couple of functional roles over the course of your career. It's easy, I think, to start from engineering and branch out. It's a little bit harder to be a business person and move into a very technical domain, uh, but I have seen people do it. If that's a goal of yours, I would encourage you to think about, as you take your first job, what particular pieces of your resume you want to build out. The ones that I think have been most valuable to me, uh, software development and product, uh, sales, and marketing. Um, it's also the case, actually, that it's useful to know how to read a balance sheet and look at uh, aged accounts receivables. But I think you can get that in a class. I don't think you need to go be a finance person in order to, to learn those jobs. Uh, but being a generalist, especially if you want to be a senior leader in the business, uh, is very useful. Because if you know how all the jobs are done in general, you can bring in people who are really, really good at them. I'm actually a really lousy VP of sales. Uh, I'm doing the job at Cloudera right now. I don't like it, right? I understand what pieces need to be done design a comp plan, hire reps, divide up territories, set targets, set quotas, motivate them to go close the deals. I get all that. It just doesn't float my boat. It's not what I like to do for a living. But I understand what I'm looking for in a really killer VP of sales. I need to find somebody who's not only good at all that stuff, but is a lot more passionate about doing it well than I am. Similarly, I know how to hire someone who can run product, who can run engineering. I know what to look for in a great marketing person. It has been my practice to, in my company, run as much of the company, as much of the functional organization as I can. So when we started, I was responsible for a lot of stuff. My co-founders handled product specifically, but I was paying attention to sales and marketing. As soon as I get to the point, point where there is so much to do that I'm doing a really crappy job, then I know it's time to go hire a specialist. So if you're building a startup, it's good to keep the number of people in senior roles fairly small and for you as a founder to go be as hands-on as you can possibly be. Really go talk to customers. Really try to close some deals. You'll learn the most that way about what works and what doesn't work. But once you've got those lessons, 
and once too much of your day is spent on that stuff, you should go hire people who really know how to do these jobs. And, and in the Bay Area, there is just an enormous diversity of talent. That's true, actually, in a lot of the US, but, but out here, we're especially blessed with uh, good people. Hard to find, hard to hire, but there are a lot of them uh, on the ground and in the field. This is a personal philosophy of mine. And, and I said earlier that you want to create the kind of organization that allows you to attract great people. One of my former employers is Oracle. Uh, and if you guys know Oracle, you know who Larry Ellison is. Larry is a really captivating leader. He's enormously successful. He's built a tremendous company. But that company is absolutely Larry Ellison, right? And when it does well, it's in general viewed as Larry's success. In particular, I'd argue, it's viewed by Larry as Larry's success. He could well be right. That's not the way I think about what we're doing at Cladera. If, in my view, you're going to be an effective leader, you want to accept the blame for things that go wrong. After all, you're the one setting the direction. You're the one managing and monitoring and paying attention to prog progress. You're hiring. You're deciding who comes in and does the job. If things aren't going well, there's probably more as a leader that you need to do. You need to notice earlier. You need to fix the problems. Right? When things do go well, it's enormously important to share the praise, to, to let the team that did the work get the glory. Uh, this is actually a lesson I learned from reading uh, Bob Noyce's biography. He's one of the two people that started Intel. Uh, there is no more productive, no more successful way of rewarding an employee and really getting enormous enthusiasm and dedication and loyalty than praising guys publicly. You can pay them a lot of money, but that's only money. And they don't notice that in the same emotional way that they notice a well-timed word of praise. Right? Uh, it's also the case that if you pass credit around, if you praise people when they do well, when you have to correct them, they will notice much more readily. That is, if you scream at people all the time, if you push blame down, people are going to tune you out. They don't want to hear it. right? If you do that rarely, then when you do raise your voice, people are going to pay attention to you. So this has been a very good way for me to build a good culture and a lot of enthusiasm at the past several companies I've been at. And I encourage you to follow the practice. This lesson actually is articulated in this way by one of my co-founders at uh, Cloudera, a guy named Jeff Hammerbacher. And he was formerly at Facebook. We were early on trying to figure out basically what the market looked like, who we were going to be, what opportunities there were. And the natural thing to do is to sit down and think about, well, OK, so who are the customers, and who are the competitors, and, and what are we going to do? At Facebook, Jeff told us, they never paid any attention to competitors. Not, not like, oh, yeah, we know we got to worry about MySpace. It was just not even a thought. Facebook concentrated on building exactly what it wanted to build to delight its customers. And it literally paid no attention to what the other big social networking web properties were doing, at least if you believe Jeff's story. Right? The advantage of doing that, the advantages of doing that really are twofold. So first, if you focus on your customers, on what they need, you can do a much better job of delighting them. If you're out talking to them about what they want and how to make them happy, you're going to turn much better product much faster. They're going to know that you love them, and that's going to turn into money, new sales, new revenue for the company. But there's also this enormous risk in focusing on competitors. And that is that you start to define yourself in terms of someone else. Right? If you want to make a startup company, if you want to grow something organically, quickly, especially something that's going to get to be big, you need to define who you are all on your own. You need to figure out what market you're in. You need to position your products. You need to build your company, not respond to what other people are doing. At one of my startup companies, we were confronted with uh, a competitor in the market. Not someone, frankly, that we were running into in deals, but someone who decided that what we were doing was fundamental, important, and driving new customer and market behavior. 
And they began reacting to us. They began drafting off our messaging. Now, by the way, this is when I'm like 11 people, right, with a little bit of money in the bank. And this seven-year-old business is following along behind me, picking up my breadcrumbs. It was a little bit flattering, right? But it was a real mistake for those guys to suddenly leap into what I was doing. I'm blindingly good at what I do. Our company knows its products, and that's been true at all the companies I've been at. Another company trying to come in and be like us can't, right? They don't have our people. They don't have our technology. They don't know what we know. And they're ignoring their customers when they're worrying about me and my customers. So if you enter the market, if you start a new company, it's very, very valuable not to pay attention to competitors, but to pay attention to customers. And, and I would do it this extremely. I would, I would refuse, if investors asked, to position myself against competitors. You can do that for a while. In the boardroom, they start to get a little antsy if you never name a single competitor. But we still, at Cloudera, don't think in terms of competition. We think in terms of opportunity and what we need to do for customers. And certainly, we wind up selling against other companies sometimes, but that's not where we waste our time. This is another piece of sort of soft and fuzzy philosophy, but it's very much who we try to be. Uh, this is my philosophy for running a company. There are two kinds of deal you can do. Hard deals, negotiated brutally, executed firmly, where you seek to get all the advantage for yourself. And, and you can, by the way, be very successful building businesses doing that. It's hard to build long-term sustainable businesses doing that because sooner or later you've burned down the entire forest. You, you don't have people who want to work with you. If instead you create relationships with partners, with customers, with other vendors in the space, they're mutually beneficial. You're going to find people who are invested in your success who want to work with you. An example I use here, and, and, and it's easy to pick on Oracle because they're publicly traded and their behavior is well known, but it really is Oracle. So over the past few years, Oracle has continued its long-standing practice of customer audits. So you sign a license agreement with Oracle, and you agree we're going to run n copies of Oracle's products on our, on our servers in our data center. Oracle reserves the right to come in and count the copies you're running. And by God, they do, right? And they frequently find that customers have I think, in general, innocently, exceeded their quotas. The reaction is immediate, swift, and punitive, right? There's penalties, and you've got to pay up, and you've got you've to buy the licenses that you didn't have. That act, that is barging in through the front door, jackboots on, auditing customers, alienates customers intensely. As soon as they can, they migrate off that technology. It's not that these customers are bad. It's not that they're pirating the software. It's that a couple extra copies got installed. Right? The relationship between the vendor and the customer is adversarial in a way that's really not healthy there. Right? It's much better if you find that an agreement has been violated, that you sit down and try to negotiate a solution before you get punitive. That's really the advice that I'm offering here. Actually, I'll give you another Oracle example. So there's a lawsuit going on right now you guys probably have heard about. Oracle bought Sun Microsystems. Sun was the original developer of Java, uh, actually, based on some more Berkeley grads. Um, in the course of writing the Java software, Sun did two things. It copyrighted the software that it wrote, so nobody could make copies of that software and sell it without Sun's permission. And they acquired some patents. So there's some stuff that Java does that the US Patent uh, Technology Office looked at and decided it was patentable. And so Sun owns some patents. You rewind about four years. No, no, it's 2010. So yeah, it's four or six years ago. Google wanted to build a mobile telephone operating system. This was the very early days of Android, right? So they knew they wanted it to be based on Linux. They also knew that they wanted Java to be the language that people developed applications in. They thought that would be really great. Google violently didn't want its customers to have to pay money to Sun. They didn't want to license the Sun Java implementation. Right? So the Google engineers had this genius idea. Well, Sun owns the copyright on Java, but the specs are in the public domain. 
So we'll take some people who've never looked at Sun's implementation, and we'll write our own. And dodged the copyright restrictions on Sun's implementation. But it turns out, not the patent restrictions. So Google bought Sun and has now sued, I'm sorry, Oracle bought Sun and owns that patent portfolio and has now sued Google over use of the patents. Now, I'll tell you a few things. So first, I think software patents are bull. They shouldn't be, uh, they shouldn't be issued. But I need to be honest when I say that and tell you that Cloudera has gone out and, and acquired a bunch of them. They are right now the landscape, and my principles should have prevented me from doing that. But I am too afraid of what standing here naked would mean if we got approached by somebody who wanted to enforce a patent case against us. But I think, I think patents are bogus. I, I, I don't think software patents should be issued. But in this case in particular, patents on open source technology, I think it could well freeze innovation in the space. Google suit, uh, Oracle suit against Google for patent infringement is absolutely justifiable, but I don't think a recourse to the courts was the right way to deal with Google's, uh, Oracle's desire to move into the mobile space. I think that lawsuits are very much in the Oracle culture, and that's why that happens. So my advice to you, the golden rule makes sense. Be nice to the people around you. Last thing I want to say, uh, and then I'll actually open up for questions. I know that a bunch of the MBA students need to leave in just a couple of minutes, so I'll try to wind up here. And I'm glad to take questions generally. It is still the case that we see companies getting started where the investors and the founders are focused from the very first days on how they're going to cash out. And I want to urge you guys not to do that. Right? Don't, don't build that company. It, it was a lot worse, actually, in the late 90s and early zeros. You saw a lot of companies get funded with no intention of ever building a sales team. Right? They were going to invent some technology, write some software, and then flip the company to Google. Then a couple of years later, it was flipped the company to Cisco. Now the thing seems to be, I'm going to sell my company to VMware. Right? You should try to build a business that is long-term and sustainable. That is, delivering real product, real value to real customers. If instead of, from the very first days, focusing on how you're going to exit the business, you focus on how you're going to make it climb. If you focus on the elevator, how are we going to get big? How are we going to do more? How are we going to raise this business up? You will build a long-term sustainable business. And hey, by the way, customers, recurring revenue, growth, market traction, those things often lead to exit. Right? So if you focus on growing and building your business, you will eventually find your exit. And, and that has been the case at each of the three businesses that I've been part of that's had a real exit. Right? We focused on what we we're going to do to create a company that could have an IPO, right? <coughs> so far, none of those companies have had an IPO. I'm still hopeful for the last one. If I had an index card and could find myself at the Triple Rock 20 years ago, those are the things that I would put on it. Uh, the last thing, actually, is a good piece of advice for a manager. You should always be asking questions about your business, but really, that's intended for you guys. I'm going to stop talking and let you ask questions. And I know if some of you have to leave, you can just quietly do that. That's, that's fine. So uh, floor is open, and I'm glad to take questions on the talk or technology or anything that's interesting to you. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, it's easy to get capital. It's hard to hire good people. How do you manage dilution, equi uh, equity dilution in a startup? Um, the typical progression for sort of A-list VCs these days, if you're, if you're funding up a company over three rounds, the first round, they want to buy between 20 and 25% of your business. The second round, they want their ownership stake to be sort of 35 to 40%. And by the C round, and the C round is often as much as anybody needs to do, they'd like their ownership stake to be 50%. That's just what they've gotten addicted to over time. Now, with alternatives, like super angels, you can get lower equity dilution from early funding rounds by choosing different capital sources. But fundamentally, if you're going to build your business on someone else's money, and especially if you're going to work with professional investors, you're a little bit walled in. They're not going to invest. They understand what the rules are. And they're going to force you as an entrepreneur to take a deal that, whose terms they largely define. You should push as hard as you can 
for the lower end, but they simply won't invest if you're offering them 10 or 15% of the deal. So professional investment comes with its rules, and you kind of play by those rules, and you, you try to manage the story internally. If you can get to profitability quickly, then you don't need to raise more money, right? And that's the best thing you can possibly do to manage dilution. Hiring great people does sometimes require unnatural acts in passing out stock. Uh, you wind up making substantial grants, especially for early employees. You know, my advice as an entrepreneur is don't sweat that, right? You ought to want your co-founders and the people who are building the business with you to get rich. Certainly, if the VCs are going to make a lot of money, you'd like your line staff, likewise, to have a really great exit. So manage equity. Try to be disciplined in the grants you pass out to employees. Try to be as parsimonious as you can with equity you sell and raise money as late as you practically can. Not when you're starving to death, but don't bring it in earlier than you need to. Uh, except I broke that rule twice in a row just lately. But don't bring the money in earlier than you need to because more revenue in the business, more growth in the business is going to give you a much better, basically put you in a much better place to sell less equity at a higher price. Other questions? Yeah? There are a bunch of different roles you're going to have. So, so if you want to be the CEO, then I think you need to plan your career so that you spend some time in product, you spend some time in sales, you spend some time in marketing, you get a little bit of familiarity with finance, right? I think all of those are important. If you want to be an entrepreneur and a member of a founding team, but you don't necessarily want to be the CEO, th then you don't need to be that broad. It's not that important to go chase a whole bunch of different experience. In fact, I would say being much, much deeper in the field, in the, in the role that, that you care most about is more important. It's always good to know a little bit about the jobs that are adjacent to you in the organization so you can support those people better. But unless you want to run everything, you don't need to learn everything. Yeah. So let me be absolutely clear, because I see we're being recorded here. I am making no forward-looking statements. Um, Cl Cloudera, dreams of, Cloudera dreams of an IPO, right? We, we dream of having an IPO. We absolutely are building a business with the intent of getting to IPO. Um, and I think, for a bunch of reasons that are kind of commercially, that this company can do that. Who knows? Maybe a deal is offered that we can't refuse. So far, none has been. But there are legal and financial requirements for having an initial public offering. There's an S-1 document that you have to file with the SEC, and you need audited financials for a bunch of things. So there's a bunch of form to go through. And honestly, you should go hire a CFO to worry about all that stuff, right? That's, that's special magic black art finance, right? Um, and, and you just go pay those guys a lot of money and they just do it for you, right? There are strategic and market things you need to do. And, and in general, those are recurring revenue, continued growth, strong customer adoption, right? So recurring revenue is the best way to grow. If every customer I have keeps paying me every year, then I, get, then I get this year all the money from all my previous years and also any new business I can do. Right? So that's very important. Um, the other thing is you need to be in a market that can be big. Right? If you can be the leading supplier of widgets in a $50 million market, you're hosed. Right? I mean, you could have 80% of that $50 million market and nobody would care. Right? If you're in a billion dollar or a multi-billion dollar market, then people will care. And so that's our insight right now. We think we're building in a market that could be tens of billions of dollars. Right. Yes? What quality do Steve Jobs and Jeff Bezos exercise to drive their companies? I bet you could get one or two of those guys here to talk to you if you really twisted some arms, and I would encourage you to do it. I admire and respect them both. Bezos actually bugs me a little bit because I never had the idea for Amazon.com but as soon as I heard it, it was just obviously a good idea. And, and there's been like three or four times in my career where that's happened, where you're like, oh, I could have thought of that, but I didn't. And every single one of those businesses has been hugely successful. I think those guys focus on customers and on quality. And they're both inspirational leaders. Um, I've never worked for Steve Jobs, but he's got 
a bit of a reputation for being a hard ass in the industry. So, you know, people don't always like working for him. He's super charismatic. I think people genuinely like working for Bezos. At least that's the scuttlebutt I hear. But the companies they work for love and respect them in, a, in an important way. They, they, they put their personal stamp on the business that they're building, right? Jobs, legendary, legendary commitment to beauty and excellence. Uh, you know, in the 80s, was it 80s? Maybe 90s. Michael Dell said, Apple is a waste. They should shutter the company, sell the assets, give the money back to the shareholders. Apple's market cap is now north of Dell's market cap. And I hope Michael noticed the day that that happened. That was Steve's work. He brought that company back from the dead by focusing on building stuff like iPhones. Right? What else? So, yeah, so the question is, when should you raise money? Because I said I'd raised money too early. And in fact, I was talking about Cloudera. So we raised a little more money than we needed in our A round. Um, but it was right when the markets were falling apart. And I didn't want to have to go raise money again soon. So we sold a little more equity, raised a little bit more money than we strictly needed to at the time. And I don't regret that decision. Um, we had spent virtually none of that money by springtime of 2009. And I don't know if you guys remember, but so 2008, just as we closed our A round, the bodies were falling on Wall Street. The markets were just cratering. I think Lehman that week right, went under. Um, by springtime 2009, we were walking around in the dark, and you could hear water dripping. I mean, it was just the markets were awful. It was not at all clear that the economy was ever going to get better. But at that time, <laughs> My company was doing great. You know, we were getting written of the Wall Street Journal. We were winning customers. Investors were banging on the door. I knew that by now I would need more cash, but I had no idea then whether right now I'd be able to raise more cash. There was a lot of uncertainty in the financial markets at the time. So we made a decision a year and a half ago to raise money when we absolutely didn't need it. And that was all about hedging. That was just about making the risk go away. I'm going to sell equity probably at a lower price than I really need to later, but I'm going to take all the risk off the table, get the money in now. Um, interestingly, it is a year and a half since I raised that money. I have not yet spent the first dollar of that secondary funding round. right? So I really did raise it earlier than I needed to. If I were going to give you advice, when should you go raise money? The answer is six months before you need it. That's sort of practical entrepreneurial advice. If you wait until three months before you need it, What'll happen is the investors you talk to, ah, you know, I'm going to be on vacation next week, and uh, we're going to turn that paper around. Oh, we missed a deadline. Be... They can eat three months and, and basically back you up against a wall. They can get you to the point where you're starving and must take the deal terms that they offer. So you want to leave yourself enough runway that you've got reasonable time to close a deal. And you should be able to close any funding round in less than three months. Really, you ought to be able to do it in six weeks, but you need motivated and excited investors to do that. But you should raise the money at least that much before you need it. The one other piece of advice I'll give you, having said don't raise it too early, is there are just crack pipe valuations going on in the market right now. Uh, if you have cloud in your name, I happen to know, uh, guys will make ridiculous offers for a piece of the business. You feel sorry for them. You don't want dumb people in your boardroom. But hey, man, sometimes that cash is just too tempting. It is the case if you're getting crazy valuations. If you know that you could get those same valuations from smart people a year later, maybe you just want to take it. right? So, so you should be opportunistic. But, but realistically, you shouldn't sell equity sooner than you have to because you don't get as good a price. Yeah. Excellent question. So the question is, could you bootstrap and build a, a solid business? Actually, Sleepy Cat, we did exactly that. We never took a single dollar of investment capital. Um, for the first couple years, we paid ourselves $25,000 a year in salary, which actually, for you grad students, may seem like real money. Uh, to my wife, not so much. Um, we paid ourselves starvation wages and basically funded the business on deals. That comp the Sleepy Cat was founded on a quarter million dollar consulting contract, basically, with Netscape. That, that gave us enough money to fund the work that we wanted to do. And we never looked back. We hired behind revenues, so pretty slowly. We grew 30% year on year, which in venture-backed startup world is not great. I can tell you that 
Illustra had a half a billion dollar exit. Oracle has not uh, disclosed the terms of the Sleepy Cat acquisition. It was material to me, right? It was, it was enough money that it was really life changing for me, but it was nowhere near half a billion dollars. So it's a little bit difficult to build the kind of rocket ship growth and venture backed exit that you can get over other paths. On the other hand, as the founder, you retain a lot more control, right? You don't have investors beating you up for strategic reasons that don't match your goals in the business. So you can, I did, I loved it, but notice what I did. My last company was organically grown and, and funded on revenues and I loved doing that. But when we started Cloudera, I knew that what I wanted to do was take advantage of a, I think, tens of billion do dollar a year opportunity. And in order to do, do that, I knew I needed to spend in advance of growth. So are we out of time here? <laughs>